Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and we're on the serious final stretch of our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. And I want to say thank you once again to Fix It Stupid, who asked me to read this book a long time ago, and I started on that journey. It's been an interesting process for me to be reading a book out loud publicly, something I've never done. And then to somewhat be accountable to people that I have said that I was going to read this book to. So it's been an interesting uh, kind of process. We are on the final chapter, uh, chapter 12, The Urgent Need for Scientific Adversaries. And this chapter is really only four pages long, so we might finish up tonight. So I'm just going to get right to it, uh, and I will uh, see how far we get. <clears throat> Chapter 12, The Urgent Need for Scientific Adversaries. We have pointed out how science technology and science technologists fail in their obligations to respond to the needs of society. They respond only to their own inner dynamic. The present growing environmental crisis demonstrates that science and technology have actually begun to operate to the detriment of society in several obvious ways. Atomic energy science and technology provides cogent but by no means isolated examples of operating to society's detriment. Wow, this could have been written today. Like, is it any wonder? I mean, 1970, we're in 2015, 45 years ago. It is not mysterious that this should be the case. Science and technology in modern society are well-financed endeavors of government or industry or both acting as bedfellows. It is an axiom that the scientists follow the dollars available to support any particular branch of scientific or technological endeavor. And they learn without evil intent what the facts of life are with respect to success in big science and technology. The economic health and well-being of the science technologists is directly related to the continued infusion of massive numbers of dollars into his branch of science or technology. The motivation, conscious or unconscious, to discover wonderful benefits of the particular science or technology is self-evident. Indeed, it is almost inevitable that the scientist-technologist will certainly have employment and even rise on the ladder of success if he maintains an undying faith in the glories for society in the continual growth of his particular branch of science and technology. Criticism of such glories is hardly calculated to increase the governmental or industrial financing of that particular branch of science or technology. And hence, criticism rarely leads to the next rung on the ladder to success. Thus, a process of selection goes on in science technology which assures that those who fail to perceive the glories are steadily and unmercifully weeded out of the selection process. And this lesson is rarely lost upon the remaining scientists technologists. As a result, in an established field of science or technology, we must not be at all surprised at the existence of a remarkable group of think-alikes. Great word, think-alikes. It is no accident that criticism of the goals and effects of the science technology area is rarely heard from within the ranks. Let's read that again. It is no accident that criticism of the goals and effects of the science technology area is rarely heard from within the ranks. A particular branch of technology can be totally without meaning in fulfilling societal needs or obviously operating against the fulfillment of critical needs of society. With a liberal infusion of dollars, scientist technologists support scientist technologist support of that branch of technology will be almost unanimous. 
For those technological programs that are meaningless, the scientists involved are no serious threat to human welfare. They are they at least are thereby kept employed and away from serious mischief. For those technological programs which operate against fulfillment of societal needs, the scientists and technologists do indeed represent a direct threat to society in that they are used to support the concept of omnipotence and omniscience of science and technology. New subtitle. Where scientists are ineffective. By offering credibility to the proposal of an anti-ballistic missile system, these men lend credibility to the concept that nuclear war is thinkable and tolerable. Where environmental deterioration threatens as a result of technological enterprise, they create a cruel illusion that science and technology will certainly be able to rescue us a belief that is tantamount to national suicide. And for those engaged in useless or detrimental programs, we suffer the additional loss of a diversion of scientific talent and manpower from meaningful, needed programs in the service to humanity. Some scientists have spoken out against the ABM system, war, the ABM uh, let me read that again. <clears throat> Some scientists have spoken out against the ABM system, war-related research, supersonic transport, and excessive funding of NASA. Some have complained about the wrong priorities in mission-related research. And especially recently, some scientists have sounded the alarm concerning one or other uh, aspect of the impending or existing environmental crisis. Why have all these scientists not been more effective? One major reason is that the majority of scientists, for reason previously described, are hacks who support the proposed or ongoing projects of industry or government, either openly or by silence. The public, therefore, assumes that the majority of the concerned and competent scientific community supports the programs, while a few dissidents make a noise. However, the major reason for the lack of effectiveness of those who question what industry or government is doing in the technology is that it takes money and time, both in abundance, to fight City Hall. The proponents are invariably well organized and well funded by government or industry or both. Quite the opposite prevails for the opponents. Moreover, legal and regulatory procedures are so structured that the opponents must necessarily present a much stronger case against that particular program than the well funded proponents of the program. Inertia, procedure, and rules inevitably favor the technology and its promoters, even if an environmental disaster is widely evident as a result of continuation or initiation of the technological endeavor. Hello, Fukushima. Oh, my God. Well, I reject that. I reject that. I think we've transcended that. I think it's about our spirit energy. We're going to be able to overcome these fucking rat bastards. Back to the book. Short-sightedness has been a major distinction of technological endeavor and commonly operates not only against societal needs, but even against the long-range interests of the very promoters of the endeavor. Atomic energy is an excellent illustration of a case where both societal needs and the promoter's future are adversely affected by the technology itself and its technologists. It is evident that we are urgently in need of a mechanism for effective criticism of present-day science and technology. We must learn a mechanism for articulating a new set of priorities that could begin to lead science and technology in the direction of fulfilling society's needs. It must by now be obvious that this will require the funding of a group of scientists and perhaps non-scientists in collaboration specifically for this purpose. 
And the history of technological enterprise teaches us that it is absolutely essential for such groups to be funded in such a manner as to be completely independent of government and industry. If economic or other reprisal remains, I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. If economic or other reprisal remains possible, no effectiveness will be achieved. We must, above all, learn to accomplish the establishment of such groups now as a high priority. I'll keep reading. The scientists and others who compose such critical groups must be activists in the best sense of the word. They must necessarily interact effectively with the members of Congress, with activities in many fields, and with pressure groups in the country. Such association and interaction with activists, pressure groups, and the Congress can serve two important purposes. First, the scientists in such criticism groups will be aided in their own understanding and articulation of the basic needs of society. This will in turn aid the activists and pressure groups and the Congress in such articulation. The association will serve a further important purpose, creation of a mechanism for simultaneous, for si, simu, I'm sorry, let me read that again. The association will serve a further important purpose, creation of a mechanism for stimulation of public awareness of societal needs and our status with respect to their fulfillment. Our one essential feature of the entire concept is that the quality of the scientific endeavor in the criticism group must be unassailable. For if the technical detail in the critical science is other than superb, the impact will be minimal. An impact is the sine qua non of success of the critical endeavor. And I am going to stop here with the top of 231. The new subtitle is, The Goals of Science Should Be Questioned. And I promise not to take too long. I had exams all this last week and... I'm sorry, it took me a few days to get back to you guys, but I'm just, um, wrong glasses, up to my earballs with work and school, my usual blah, blah, excuses as to why I can't get back to this every day. But um, by the way, new photo by Ricardo Donopoli, which is for sale if anybody is interested. It will help to fund the post ignorance project. Uh, event that's going to happen in Europe. Kevin's going to Europe for sure. He's got a ticket and he's going. So we're looking to help fund his ability to stay there and pay for his house while he's gone. The asking price on this uh, painting is 3000 uh, $3, I'd like it to be 3000 is $1,000. So if anybody knows anyone that likes to spend money on quality art, please let me know and I can send them some really good photographs so they can make a decision. Other than that, um, I think we're going to be finishing the book the next time we talk, or the next time I talk, and you guys listen <laughs> and make your comments. I guess we're talking then. But um, I'll talk to you soon. Put your courage feet on, and thanks for uh, loving our planet and not giving up, and thanks for refusing to be battered wives. So, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on, put your thinking caps on, and let's stay active. Ciao.